Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'd like to welcome you to this press conference here at the 2018 Annual Meeting of the New Champions in Tianjin. Uh, my name is Amanda Russo. I'm on the public engagement team here at the World Economic Forum. And uh, for those of us watching on our, our webcast, thank you very much for joining us. If you'd like to engage in social media, both in the room and online, the hashtag is AMNC18. So we have a very exciting 30 minutes planned here for those in the room and those online. Thank you very much. We have uh, two gentlemen here from BCG. We have Jeffrey Walters, managing, managing Director and Partner, and we have Mr. David He, who's also Managing Director and Partner. Um, and the planned press conference here is on decoding digital consumers. So they're going to hopefully tell us a little bit more about what that means. Um, and so to kick off with some key findings, I'd like to turn it over to the gentleman on my left here. Jeff, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for, for coming today. Um, being the annual meeting of the new champions, we wanted to talk about emerging market consumers. Um, a few key messages for today, and which I'll elaborate. I mean, first, your online, your digital consumer is more likely to be in an emerging market today than a developed one. Right? I think it's a premise we all understand. Second, their impact on consumer spending is in many cases, uh, underestimated by about 2x, and we'll explain why today. And we find that many companies are not keeping pace with the, the differences of these consumers across markets or the rate at which they change. Now, given those, uh, you know, those challenges and those opportunities, and we've been helping our clients uh, to, to capture the spend of digital consumers around the world, uh, we teamed with our, our, our global partnership and our Center for Customer Insight, which has specialists around the world, to do a new survey of uh, 15,000 consumers, all the way from Rio de Janeiro to Nairobi to Tianjin, in fact, we had sample size here, um, which led to our, uh, the, the report that we're launching today, uh, Digital Consumers, Emerging Markets, and the $4 trillion Future. So let me share, you know, I think some of the important findings. I mean, first, as I alluded to, the majority of the world's online population is now in emerging markets. And nearly all the growth in new online consumers will, through 2022 will come from emerging markets. So if we look at emerging markets now, the change in the past uh, eight years has been dramatic, right? So now about half of the population is in emerging markets is online versus less than a quarter uh, in 2010. Um, now the emerging market internet user or digital consumer outnumbers the developed market one by two to one. And if we look at growth over the next five years through 2022, emerging markets will add 900 million new consumers, digital consumers, versus just 80 million more in developed markets. Now, those are large numbers. You know, we often care about their impact on spend and consumption, right? that their impact on consumption is often underestimated by about two times. Typically, when we think of the digital consumer, we think about e-commerce, and we measure their impact by how much they spend online. Yes, it is true, e-commerce spend has grown about 4x in emerging markets since 2012, and it will double again by 2022. To give you a sense, that's about $800 billion today, about $1.7 trillion in 2022. But if we look more broadly and say how much spend in emerging markets is digitally influenced, and digitally influenced refers to purchases that consumers make uh, where they may not actually make the final purchase online, but what they choose to buy or how they choose to buy it was influenced by their online behavior. That's the portion of consumer spend that's often underestimated. Uh, it's about a two times larger uh, amount of spend than uh, the e-commerce spend specifically. And it certainly has grown as well too. It has grown about 3x since 2012, and it will more than double again by 2022. So it will reach about $4 trillion of consumer spend in emerging markets by, uh, by 2022. Now, many companies, you know, many organizations see those large numbers and they say, okay, yes, exciting, but you know, those digital consumers are spread across a very heterogeneous set of markets um, with some very different uh, circumstances, very different levels of development. Um, what we've tried to do is simplify the world into really three stages of digital development. Um, stage one, right, is uh, what we call digitally aware. These are comp uh, countries like the Philippines, uh, Morocco, uh, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, right? Here in these places, about only about 13% of your urban consumer shops online. And if you look at why the consumer shops online, they're really looking for low prices. So fundamentally, the first reason is I want a low price, I want a good discount. That's the, that's the hook that gets the consumer to buy online for the first time there. 
Um, if you look at you know, how consumers pay for what they buy online, about three-fifths of the purchases are, are, are paid for by cash on delivery in this first stage. Right? So overall, in this first stage, these digitally aware markets, right, e-commerce represents about 1% of total retail sales, and digital influence represents about 5% of total retail sales. So the influence is five times larger than the e-commerce sales, yet it is uh, still a relatively small single-digit number. As we move to the second phase, we have three major markets that sit inside what we call the digitally advancing countries. Right? These are Indonesia, uh, India, and Brazil. So here, if we look at the simple metrics in these markets, e-commerce rep represents around 4% of total retail spend, and digital influence represents about 20%. Right? So again, we have that 5x relationship, right? It's about five times larger in digital influence than in uh, e-commerce. Once markets reach this stage, we find typically about 50% of urban consumers are shopping online. And then last, uh, and certainly not least, we have what we call the digitally evolved markets. And uh, I think it's exciting to be uh, launching this report here in China because as we look at our metrics of uh, e-commerce as a percent of retail sales and digital influence, China is the largest in the world, as many of you know. Right? So, oh, but overall, the, the markets uh, that are here are many developed markets. Um, and uh, we, China is really the first large emerging market to have moved uh, into this digitally evolved stage. Um, here, e-commerce on average rep represents around 15% of uh, total retail sales, and digital influence represents about 40% of total retail sales. Now, China is literally off the charts when it comes to these types of metrics. Um, about 90% of urban consumers in China are online shoppers. Um, and I think most interestingly, when you talk to a consumer in China, when you talk to a consumer in the UK, when you talk to a consumer in Korea, you know, markets that are inside this uh, digitally uh, evolved stage, price is a reason consumers shop online. Price is not the dominant reason consumers shop online. So what becomes equally important is convenience, uh, variety, um, and shopping experience, which I think when you see the, the types of rich uh, video content that now accompanies uh, the e-commerce experience in China, you, you get a sense of what the consumer in a market at this phase is, uh, is looking for. Now, the speed through which countries move through these phases is not equal. Some countries move faster through the phases. Some countries move more slowly through these phases. Uh, we've done a large statistical analysis across all these markets to really identify what are the key conditions or what are the key ingredients, you know, what, what is the cocktail that one makes in a market to really accelerate digital influence and, uh, and, uh, and then eventually e-commerce. So the, these ingredients really fall into four types. The first I call access. So it's about smartphone penetration. Right, and the cost of data plans. Right? So can I access the internet on a mobile device? And is it, am I not worried about the cost of my data? Right? Uh, second is the means. Do, is there an adequate uh, group of consumers in these markets that have uh, the sufficient spending power to be shopping online? So simply, this can be measured by the size of the middle class across the markets. Um, the econo relative economics of, of e-commerce versus offline retail we also find quite important in explaining the growth and the size of e-commerce in these different markets. So specifically, we look at the relative cost of physical retail versus, offline re of, uh, versus online retail, right? So or is commercial real estate expensive or not, right? Relative to what it costs to, to delivery. And because delivery costs matter in e-commerce uh, so significantly, we also look at the, the cost of shipping parcels, right? And small parcel shipments in the market. And then last but not least, the fourth uh, set of elements that matter right, is really related to innovation. And so we look at indexes of startup innovation, and uh, we also look at the level of startup funding in these markets. Uh, that would be venture capital, private equity, angel, and all the different types. Um, why is this important? Is because, you know, as what well, we've learned in China with the internet giants here, you have to overcome the barriers that consumers have for, for shopping online. You have to overcome the barriers that they have for moving their discovery process from offline to online. And really, it's innovation in product offering and consumer experience enabled by the right technology, which uh, makes that happen. So you have to have the players in the market who are able and willing and funded to do so. So, you know, I think for many of us sitting here in what, what is now the most advanced digital market, it, it may not be surprising that if we look across the whole span of emerging markets, right, we find some quite 
significant variation right, in their levels of development. Uh, in our point of view, you know, we find that there's a, a set of important calls to action uh, for companies, global companies, um, uh, and companies in these markets, and we find an important call to action for policymakers as well too. First, we find few companies are responding to the differences in the emerging versus the developed market consumer, digital consumer, effectively. Right? Second, we find few companies are adapting their approach to these markets as fast as the digital consumer in those markets is evolving. And last, we find that few companies have built the customized playbooks that take into account you know, what these, this simplified view of the world, which helps one manage uh, a very heterogeneous set of emerging markets uh, more, more directly and, and efficiently. So a couple examples, right? I mean, throughout the emerging market. So what's an example of the differences that consumers need to under, that companies need to understand about the digital consumer in emerging markets? Well, as not surprising for this, us in China, marketplaces are the top place to shop, right? Marketplaces, meaning it's a, it's a, a you know, a, a collection of third party sellers, uh, like you see with Alibaba's platforms in China, represent about 79% of e-commerce in China. And what's interesting is, is if you look across many of the emerging markets and almost all the emerging markets across our study, um, we find that marketplaces are in fact the dominant uh, e-commerce channel. Um, second is that social media is very much a primary source of information relative and much more greater extent relative to say brands official websites or relative to search engines and, and other types of vehicles that have already been common and established in developed markets. Um, the second example is speed, right? I, I, I alluded that countries and markets are moving quickly through these levels of development. Uh, just to give you a sense, we re-ran our analysis looking backwards five years, right? India, Indonesia were one step in the, in the first, uh, first group of markets, and China was not uh, leading by these metrics at the time. China was actually in the middle bucket, right? So the pace of change to go from a, uh, just if we take China as an ex example, going from digitally advancing to digitally evolved uh, in, in just five years uh, is faster than many companies are finding that they're able to move and adopt their approach to these markets. So, you know, last but not least, we say there is a really a new digital imperative, right, for the successful business model for companies that are in these emerging markets or wanting to serve the digital consumers across these emerging markets, right? First is that now we have such significant digital influence. It means consumers are there talking about brands, talking about products, learning about products online. This is also a learning opportunity for companies. So the age of the traditional focus group where I go out and you know, over a period of weeks talk to some consumers and I come back and I think about, well, what's the consumer really thinking? That's the old way of doing things. The new way of doing things is through online connection to my consumers. How am I testing rapidly uh, new ideas and products with them? Um, the second you know, important uh, imperative is really building socially activated brands. Right? Media is expensive everywhere in the world. Right? The, in some ways, the best endorsement a, consumer, or a brand can find is when a consumer shares their experience with that brand or that product with their friends on social media. And as I explained earlier, we find this is one of the most powerful sources of information right, in the digitally aware and the digitally advancing markets. So few companies today have fully tackled and captured you know, all the opportunities to build uh, social uh, social media uh, campaigns and social media uh, effective approaches for their brands, right? And you know, last we find you know there is obviously implications for how consumers experience brands and products both offline and online. And what is so critical and so rarely executed well is a seamless experience online and offline. We talk about some companies, right, in uh, like LensCart in India, for example, um, which is primarily an an online. Uh, glasses, uh, a prescription eyeglasses company, right? But at the same time, provides both online and offline experiences where you can test, uh, you know, try things online, see them in the store, and the company always knows you, always knows how to contact you and reach you as a consumer. So you can understand. You might say, why would you know online be so important for? Uh, a, a glasses company in India when e-commerce penetration isn't that high yet. Well, that's why the digital influence is so important because it's actually digital influence that matters. So with that, uh, those are the, the, the main findings uh, of, our, of our new initiative and report. And uh, I can turn it over to David uh -huh. uh, to share some more of our, our, our findings as they relate to China. Great, thank you. Everybody got all that? <laughs> A lot we of have time for questions. We will yeah. have time for some yeah. questions. Um, David, please tell us about the, the impacts and the, the repercussions on, on China and, and, and worldwide. So, uh, 
Jeff talked about our uh, comparison for the uh, developed countries. Uh, everyone I've heard about it must be very uh, proud of what China is doing, that it's leading the world, that all the numbers, either it's about the digitalization or the total number of uh, consumers or e-commerce uh, scale, all these we should be proud of as Chinese. Of course, in the last two years, almost every month, we have to take the developed countries customers to come to the China internet companies to learn and uh, they look at the, the Alipay and uh, all these uh, uh, payment models and uh, they bring it back to their countries. They're very surprised at what China is doing and they're happy to bring these experiences back to their home country. China is really leading and the uh, top the 10 technology companies, so China and the U.S. account for half, uh, both, and uh, what we need to think about the reasons, there are about eight reasons. And indeed, there are eight factors that made this generation of Chinese consumers coming up, emerging, and made China become the pioneer of the world. Well, I would like to specify, specifically talk about four factors. The first, it's thanks to the huge market with more than one billion people. And that is why when, once you invest in digital science, digital economy, the cost is reducing and the investment return, return of investment comes back more and more. Whereas for a smaller um, market, it's difficult. And the second factor is that in traditional s industries, there were some areas that were really left behind. E-commerce doesn't work as well as in China, in the US and in Japan. Why? Because China had never experienced a sort of 7-Eleven or Family Mart, this kind of convenience store. In a developed country, country, this has never happened. That's why China went directly into this e-commerce digital economy. The second, the third point is the uh, our high level of design of manufacturing with a very low cost. And the fourth factor is the surveillance system and the government have been for the low, over the past four years quite mild in Canton, upon the Uber problem in America, Uber said the surveillance administration system is still top two. Maybe California is top one on the tolerance of government over private businesses. So China is number two, according to Uber. That's my four factors. So we talk about Tencent, Alibaba, those startups, and big, big groups. And next step, I think, it's about digital transformation of traditional industries. Chinese consumers are so used to using digital economies, such as Taobao or Alibaba, if you want, or Baidu. They search for everything, and they use uh, extensively WeChat for everything. So the behavior is already there. All we need to do is to transform the traditional logistic, financial ways of doing business, how to adapt ourselves into this very high level of economic, I'm sorry, digital experience. So it's like there's a gap between the very high level of the um, Chinese consumers on the digital concept and the very low level of traditional industries. So what do we do? I propose three things to create, recreate a consumer experience, be it the banks, the logistics, um, manufacturing. You have to catch up with the uh, high experience. The second, two, the second point is about the huge amount of data that we have that other countries don't. This reduces the cost of risk management. Sorry, this will make 
risk management very challenging. And number three is to be very responsive to new things and to break all the barriers among those factors, among those sectors. If you can do these three factors, your company will be the winner in the next battlefield because consumers are all trained to embrace the new economy and we need to work really much, very much on supply on those traditional sectors. And of course, you can't be complacent. That's, well, my uh, feedback after hearing about Jeff. I'd like to open it up to questions now. <coughs> yes, we have a question, right? Okay, I have a question. So uh, I heard that China is a pioneer in digital economy, and in the next few years, do you think this gap will be reduced or much bigger between China and the rest of the world? Yeah, you go, David, please. Okay, uh, okay um, so I'll start. Um, I think the advantage will be even bigger. And the reason I say that is because, let's talk about the um, strategy. I mean, when you have one person, 10 people, 20 people, then you have a multiplying effect. You have 1.3 billion people. Imagine that. Then it will have a rippling effect and starts from, of course, um, re retail and then media and then finance, all that are working together. And that's why you can feel that um, there is a multiplication effect when you create or design um, digital products. So I think in the next few years, China will even be more, uh, much quicker, accelerating. The second factor, the reason, is that 1.3 billion of people plus the um, production capacity and the inclusion and tolerance of authorities. These are huge advantages. Whereas, you see, in the EU, you have syndicates that have to approve if there is a law to be proposed. So syndicates have to agree with the bills, and it may take years before anything be done. Whereas in China, uh, you can get many things done in many years, so in several years. So these advantages factors are not present in all other markets. That's why I think the gap will even be bigger. Um, one thing we are lack of is the AI technology or a platform or an algorithm or a SIM card. But these are not very um, mortal problems. We can catch up. Hi, thank you. I'm from China Economic Daily to Mr. He, David. Um, what do you think about the international e-commerce? Have you done much, uh, uh, any research? I mean, Chinese consumers using international or foreign e-commerce. And why? Especially on the protection of uh, consumer rights. Using what we often consider cross-border e-commerce, it's growing very rapidly, right? I think this is an indication of the maturity and the, I would say, the, the cosmopolitan nature of the Chinese consumer today. You know, she can see television from any country in the world, right? She travels abroad, right? She goes to Hong Kong first, and then she goes to Europe, right? So really, she wants to find the world's worth of products, right? The world hasn't brought all their products to China as fast as the consumers in China want the world's worth of products. This underlies you know, a, a lot of the drive uh, towards cross-border e-commerce. And then second, you know, as we know in some categories, 
uh, there are certain countries that are perceived to have advantages in those categories. Dairy, you know, from Australia, New Zealand, right? Uh, certain food products, uh, you know, from, from other parts of the world. And so your consumer is very savvy today, right? He or she wants to say, if I'm going to buy, right, that, that milk, if I'm going to buy that lobster, I want it to come straight from the country where it came from. And the most effective and efficient way for them to do that today is often cross-border e-commerce. We'll take another question. This gentleman here in the front. Good morning. I'm from Macau. Um, after hearing your presentations, I feel very excited. I feel very excited about the next few years. So I have two questions for you. The first is, what do we call it? Is it um, internet economy? I didn't catch. But what I mean is, what kind of impact over the, the traditional economy? Because, you know, as you mentioned, China has a huge population. This impact may affect job market, as Jack Ma will uh, make many small retail stores disappear. These are jobs that are lost. And the second question is that um, most people, especially young people, use Alibaba to shop online. Then in the e-commerce, there are fake products. Then isn't that a bad thing for our line service? Um, no, I think the retail world is going to change. Offline retail is not going away. If I'm thirsty, right, I want to walk into a store across the street and in five minutes get a bottle of water or something to drink. At least in the foreseeable future, e-commerce is not going to substitute that purchase. We can get 30 deli minute delivery in China, we can't get one minute delivery in China. So. To be fair, e uh, retail is transforming. Very large stores are challenged. Some small stores and small formats are actually doing quite well. And retailers have to fundamentally rethink what are the reasons that I convince a consumer to walk into my store. So it's going to change, but it's not going to disappear. We will still have stores in the future. They'll look different, but we'll still have stores. Um, you know, the issue of, of trusting the product I buy online has been something which was originally, if I go back, you know, 10 years ago, one of the things that you could say limited e-commerce growth in China. Um, but if you think about it today, right, if uh, you know, I'm going to buy a product online, I have many reviewers of that seller, right? I have many reviewers of that product. I have so much data and information that helps me build confidence that says, mm, I think if I buy this from there, I'm going to trust that it's a, it's a true one based on the thousands of reviews that are there. If I take my analogy and I walk into my corner store, unless it's the corner store I go to every day, I don't know where that product came from. Right? So that the issue of, of, of product quality, the issue of, of what it is, you know, is it really what it says it is, it exists offline and online in, in markets. And in some ways, leading companies have found ways to build that trust even better online than is even possible to do offline. And would you like to add anything? Um, yes, I would like to um, speak about the job market. We did a research at the beginning of 2018 on AI. Uh, it's, it, its impact on the job market. And our conclusion is that there, is, there will be a reduction of 25% of manpower. And the reason is hence, those jobs that cannot be replaced by AI, sophisticated jobs. And the second is about human feelings. But simple, repetitive jobs will be and can be replaced. So. That's why the need will be, shrink, will be shrinking, but it won't disappear. So the second type of job, for example, with human feelings, sentiments won't disappear, but those jobs that are concerned with simple rep repetitive um, technological things, yes, they might disappear, but um, it makes an imbalance, which is not a bad thing because people might have a better income and a better life quality, quality of life. And second thing is that the structure of our society will be transformed. 
people who work for those simplistic, simple, repetitive jobs, they don't necessarily feel good. We should release their energy, their quality by training to, um, to make them feel happier. So, Jay Wei. This question. In the, in the white. Yes. You go, you go. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm from China News Agency. So, I've got two questions for David. The first question is about the supply reform. We have met some challenges, some difficulties. What's your point of view on this? And the second is the blockchain is a hit word. What do you think about it and its impact on finance? Uh, one on the supply side uh, reform, how what's what's it, it will become. We studied four countries' market. One, it's. Uh, uh, U.S. under Reagan and uh, Germany in 1993 and Argentina, two times the failures on the supply side, the reform and on the Japan and the failures as well. And uh, number one, it's uh, aiming at the developing the when we try to reform on the supply side, it's not about uh, reduce about the uh, the all the uh, consuming side. So it's about make sure we're aiming at growth. It's not about reducing the uh, the overstocking and overproduction only. And the, there's several. One, it's about giving more power to the market. Number two, reducing the taxes and uh, to have the incentives for the people to work and the companies to invest. And the number three, try to uh, curb the inflation and uh, try to, number four, it's about human capital re-education. And uh, number five, it's about the breaking the uh, financial barriers and to have a more transparent uh, market. And uh, either com countries succeeded or it failed uh, all about uh, these five of them. And the Regan's reform on the fourth year, it started to show effects. At the end, if you look at these uh, major principles, if China supply side the reform in the past years has made big advancements, but we've seen problems. One, there should be a balance between short term and the long term. The short term uh, stimulation of the economy and the long term development. The number one, are we able to control the hands of the government once there is uh, challenges and the, the government has to invest? Or should it be the private sector? Should, who is more effective? Number two, should we control the total? Uh, volume of the currencies ish, issuing to the market. Number three, do we have these uh, consistencies in terms of strategy? Either we're stepping on the gas or the brakes too hard. It should be a three to five years long-term uh, strategy. Do we have this consistency? And uh, number four, there are many places that we have not started, like the cutting the taxes and the burdens. And the U.S. and the Trump, since they're doing so well in this time, it has a lot to do with the tax cutting and uh, increasing the human capital's uh, capability for job reassignments, re-education, et cetera. Now we have done, not done all of our things. And we have to, the strategy, we have to set the uh, ground and uh, set the stage. And uh, we have a long way to go. We need some more time. The road is correct. We need to do it. And uh, we need to have a rebalancing. This is the right approach, right route to take. But all these short-term problems, we need to try to solve them. And the uh, blockchains, it's about the uh, talk about the chain. The chain, uh, what is the background of this technology? This technology itself, it's because of the huge reduction of the storage cost. If we look at the past 
uh, internet technology because of the communication costs hugely reduced, and then you do things through TCP IP. And because of this re same token, I can save the data in 5,000 nodes in long chain transaction and the multiple authentication and uh, all these reasons. You will not need to use blockchains. You can just use centralized computing to solve the problems. It You only have to find the right scenario to take advantage of uh, blockchains, like of the security so clearing and the clearing houses and uh, very uh, complex transactions and the long chains. For example, supply chain finances, international trades, and once you found the right uh, scenario, and then you will find the right application for the blockchains. And the blockchain itself is very mature, but it will take three to five years to get it to become uh, adopted. We'll see what happens. Um, I'd like to um, conclude this press conference by asking each of the gentlemen here to end on a soundbite. Yes. Uh, Jeff, what would your soundbite be? Yes, well, thank you to the forum and thank you for the attendees. Right, I would say, first, don't forget the emerging market digital consumer. Don't underestimate their spend, $4 trillion. <laughs> David? Okay. $4 trillion. <laughs> Well, join me in thanking the two speakers. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for everyone for joining. That concludes this press conference. Thanks very much.